have uh, Michael Cohen join us. So, um, uh, so um, in this next session, um, Andy and Michael will talk about um, being a practitioner, being on the front line, and what it takes personally to be there. And um, I hope they also get to talk a little bit about systems and waste management. That's a personal uh, request for me, um, so that you know all of us who are, who are sitting here and watching could um, you know learn more from their um, incredible experience. So um, with that, let me um, introduce Michael. Um, give me just one minute to do so. Um, hi, Mike. Can you um, unmute yourself? Um, I can mute you, but I can't unmute you. How's that? Yeah, that's good. So um, thanks, Mike, for um, joining us. And um, Andy, um, you can you can take it from here. Much appreciated. Thanks. Hi, Mike. Andy, how are you? Good, mate. Good. Excellent. So, uh, um, so uh, for those that don't uh, don't know, Mike. Uh, uh, He's uh, often described as the James Bond of the, uh, the waste management <laughs> the developing countries industry. Thank you uh, for that, Andy. Yeah, I thought I'd get that one in first, Thank and uh, so you can uh, we'll take it from there. But uh, essentially, uh, you, you've been you've been working on the front line for for uh, as long as I can remember, um, and uh, and just so uh, uh, to give it a. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, when did you get stuck into this industry, Mike? And uh, you know, what's the range of places you find yourself working? Yeah. Well, thanks, Andy. I've been listening uh, with interest to both you and Brian. So uh, very enlightening. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, in terms of well, the starting point, where, why did I get involved in waste management? I think mine's perhaps quite simple in terms of. Um, I'd say being impacted by the environment in which I grew up. So having spent the formative years of my life in Essex, east of London, um, which receives, I think, a very large proportion of waste generated um, in the city of London itself or the conurbation of London. So from a young age, I was exposed to a lot of the things we associate with the waste management se uh, sector, the trucks, uh, the dust, the litter flying down the road, um, the landfill site wasn't too far from my backyard, so all of the environmental impacts from the landfill site. And I think I was struck from quite an early age of the, uh, the negative impacts of waste management, as it were, and struck also by a sense that uh, I wanted to be involved in very simplistically trying to make the environment better and trying to clean up. So from my um, early formative years, that followed on at university, a bit perhaps like yourself and Brian doing um, various environmental courses and degrees but whether i was doing um my first degree in in geography or my master's degree in environmental science or then indeed going on to doing a diploma in waste management my particular interest was i did a lot of research in terms of impacts from landfill sites impacts on public health water environment air and i was very interested early on in terms of how we could address these impacts but in a, a cost sensitive fashion, not by throwing large sums of money at a problem, but how could things be done in perhaps a more robust and pragmatic way, which naturally led me on to, to most of my working life, which has been in the developing world. So a, a rather meandering response to your succinct question there, Andy. So where do you find yourself going nowadays? Well, um, where are you? Well, if we talk about, okay, like, like yourself, I think I've worked in more than 50 odd countries. Last week I was in Uganda working in the oil sector, uh, training government environmental inspectors how to monitor and how to regulate the oil sector, but very much from an environmental and a waste management point of view. Um, the oil sector, which is omnipresent, produces vast quantities of waste, much of which is, is hazardous. So that was last week. Um, this week, later this week, I'm off to Nigeria, again, the oil sector. It's kind of the end of the chain, um, managing cleanup of oil spills in the Niger Delta. Um, so I am a waste management practitioner, but it's a very broad church. So in terms of the oil sector waste management, what the oil spills end up with, they end up as a massive waste management problem. So there's a theme running through all of it. Um, I'm also engaged in, in Egypt at the moment with hazardous waste. I'm engaged in the Gaza Strip 
on municipal waste management. So again, very broad church and wherever you find yourself in the world, whether it's the developed world, developing world, as you say, Australia or Africa, the waste management problems are never far away. So wherever in the world you find yourself, you can immerse yourself in these waste management challenges. So, I mean, what has it uh, attracted you to, uh, you know, which the frontline problems? I mean, you are out there. I mean, uh, this involves a lot of time away from home, others, which I know, and uh, to let every, everyone else know, involves, involves a lot of personal sacrifice. Uh, it involves basically, you know, what drives you? Where, where, where's, where's, you know, where's this coming from? How, how do you manage to sustain all this? Mm -hmm. The what energy. drives me to, to spend lots of time away from home? Um, <laughs> have you met my wife? Only to, um, <laughs> I think Brian was saying earlier, it, um, when you're in the field, be it a developing country, as I've been now for over 30 years, um, I think at the risk of sounding cliched, you can really act as a catalyst for change. The problems in the developing world are probably far larger than we experience in Europe or North America. The systems are far more immature. Um, levels of governance are challenging in terms of good governance, transparency, accountability. So I think simplistically, one can have a very tangible, clear impact in these sorts of environments. And again, if I think if one is sincere about wanting to be a catalyst of change, to affect change, there's no substitute for being there in the field, in the thick of it. And as you were talking earlier about the need to be perhaps multidisciplinary in your skills, in the field, in the developing world, you've got to be something of a diplomat, a politician, a social scientist, an environmental scientist. So what drives me, I think, is, is this desire for change, seeing change and effecting change by being in the thick of it, as it were. It's one thing sitting in London um, strategizing and hypothesizing, writing policies and procedures, that's part of the equation. But it's actually, as the Americans would say, what would they say, where the rubber meets the tarmac or meets the road, where you've actually got to implement change, you've got to deal with all of the technical, social, political problems, you've got to address the omnipresent problem that you mentioned of bad governance and corruption. So. It's both challenging but extremely rewarding and stimulating being in the field. Like you, I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm, sp I'm still spending about 50% of my time in the field. And uh, over the next year or two, that, that equation, that balance would need to, ch to change a little bit so I can put my slippers on and smoke my pipe at home a little bit more. So, okay, well, there's a couple of angles we can move on from here. You know, uh, I'll start with the... the, with the with a with nice friendly one and uh, and that is okay well okay people like you and me we you know we or as you say you're getting on and I'm not quite nearly nearly catching up with you yes but uh, um, you know what about the young people when uh, coming into this industry do you see a lot of that is there you know is there much upward mobility of young professionals in our industry and, and you know what is it that you're doing to to help that I, you know, I'm not talking just about like foreigners doing consultants. I'm talking about the environmental inspectors you're training up in the country. You know, what, what's the age profile here? Well, if we, environmental inspectors, waste management inspectors, if I, if I talk about Uganda, where I was last week, um, massive problems in terms, and, and it applies across the spectrum, massive problems in terms of lack of resources, lack of equipment, human resources, financial resources. So being tasked with, in this instance, monitoring from an environmental point of view, the oil sector, but it's not a level playing field. They don't have the resources to do the job. The big industries, the oil industries have all the resources and all the power. So it, it's, it's a very unfair fight as it were. How we can start to address that in Uganda, I'm dealing with a cadre of very young, enthusiastic professionals. Um, the donor in this instance is the um, government of Norway with their oil revenue for development. And it's, it's training on the ground, it's practical experience, but it's also where possible giving individuals in developing countries perhaps the opportunity 
to, to go and look at what is happening in the developed world. So in Uganda, many practitioners are having the opportunity to go to Norway to see how the sector is being managed and being run. And I think that's part of it. But as you mentioned earlier, there's a danger that an individual could go to the developed world. And if we're talking about waste management, come back with, with the perception that everything modern is good and in the pursuit of modernity to buy the newest vehicles, containers, landfill technology, incineration. So one has to balance that because what works in Norway isn't necessarily applicable or appropriate in a sub-Saharan Africa or indeed Indian context. So I am seeing a lot of youngsters in the developing world coming through. I'm seeing that there are many barriers to their progression. There are barriers to them executing their jobs um, to the desirable degree. But uh, again, in the field with the practitioners, people like ourselves can perhaps help to um, break some of those ceilings, make people more upwardly uh, mobile and have access to the tools that they need. In the context of the UK and developing countries, I mean, are, are we seeing youngsters coming through? Well, we've just heard from a, a very uh, capable youngster there in Brian. Brian's a young man um, with a wealth of knowledge. So I am seeing youngsters coming through into the sector. That's not to say it's easy, though, because there are many challenges if you're talking about working in the development sector. If you're talking about working for the large multinational consultancy companies that you and I have worked for, the ERMs, the Mott McDonald's, the WS Atkins, the dilemma for a young individual is having the experience to make them viable to send overseas on a project to actually contribute. And you know, where do you get that experience if you haven't got the experience? So it's the chicken and egg syndrome. I, as a a practitioner and a mentor in organizations such as the consultancies. I spent many years in the United Nations Environment Program. I took it personally that it was my responsibility to train youngsters and to give them options and opportunities. So I would take, for example, I worked for three years in Nigeria, southern Nigeria. I took over those three years many young members of staff from the UN with me. Um, I would mentor them, I would give them tasks, work programs, and I would work with them in the field. Um, and that was very beneficial in terms of they've been exposed to the environment, the challenges, they come back, their confidence is enhanced, their experience is enhanced. And I think old, old individuals like ourselves, Andy, and other people listening have a responsibility to give these youngsters a leg up and open that door into the market. So that's an ongoing process. And so, I mean, the, the, um, in terms of the role of capacity building, the role of these sort of grant-based technical assistance type projects, not necessarily related or tied to infrastructure uh, grants or loans, I mean, uh, uh, given that the structural financing problems in, in many countries, but certainly, certainly not, not all, uh, in terms of allocating budgets for uh, for professional development into the sector, for you know, for staffing up uh, inspectorates, uh, environmental agencies, or uh, or ministries, or indeed uh, waste management departments in municipalities and cities, um, you know, given there is a structural problem in, in there, um, have you found you know how have you found the uh, the, the the, the response of the international development financing uh, industry, is it long enough on the ground? Or is it too much, uh, uh, you know, is there longevity in there? Does that give people a chance? And, it, and also, is it, 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 does, that, does that warp the, uh, the whole salary scales and the expectations as well? What's the, how's the dynamic of that in your experience? Well, I think there was about six or seven questions in that one uh, question. Uh, so I'll try and pick I'm my talking about question. Southern Sudan. I'll pick my way through that uh, political minefield there, but um, yeah, it, we, we could debate at nauseum, does the development model work? And I think there's a lot of uh, evidence to su suggest in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it's not working. Um, a case in point, I've just completed some work in Egypt for uh, the Euro European Bank of Development and Reconstruction, I think it is, if I've got the acronym right. But anyway, European Bank of Development. Um, looking to put money into landfills uh, to assist with waste management. So a program of landfill development on a regional basis. Um, 
I, I conducted some workshops, some site inspections where on like almost a 10 year cycle, other international donors have put money into infrastructure, <laughs> landfill sites, um, and they're, they're monoliths of failed development. They sit there, I heard Brian speaking earlier, um, in everything but name, they're dump sites. They might have the gate, they might have the way bridge, the compactors, the liners. After 10 years or so, very often after two or three years, they don't work anymore. The, la the landfill liner has been burnt through, through the race being burnt. The compactor's sitting there because there's no money for spare parts or training. The way bridges don't work. So simply creating a piece of kit is certainly, from my experience, isn't, isn't the solution. And in giving a municipality or a regional government a landfill site, you, you actually haven't helped them very much because you've then saddled them with increased operational costs, um, leachate treatment, as we were hearing, costs money. Running electric pumps in the lagoons costs money. Maintaining, repairing the equipment costs money. So very often I see local governments encumbered with pieces of kit. They didn't have the budget to operate beforehand and they certainly don't have the budget afterwards. And so it does, simply doesn't work. So it concerns me when I see another development bank coming along in a cyclical fashion some years later with the same blueprint of we'll build an engineered landfill site without taking on board what are the sustainability factors what has to be in place to make this work and for waste management and other social developments um, I think there are a number of factors now I sit before you naked Andy I don't have flip charts like you had I don't even have the playing cards that Brian had if only he could have found them but <laughs> let me talk that through um, to make waste management generally work, to make a landfill specifically work, you have to have a number of things. You've got to have cost recovery, and cost recovery invariably isn't there or is insufficient. You've got to have public education, not enough attention paid to public education. You've got to have legislation and enforcement, and you've got to build capacity. So, as it were, to go back to one of your old models, I think if you think of waste management as a table, you need four strong legs to make that stable. If the only leg that table has is a landfill site, there's no instability, there's no sustainability. Again, I'm in danger of, of meandering, but um, until development recognizes the sustainability factors, simply investing in capital works can't work from my perspective, which is where other organizations, other development organizations, to some extent differed in the UK, certainly GIZ in Germany, who come at development from another dimension. They come at it from the point of view of capacity development, as you mentioned, giving um, individuals exposure to training, resources, capacity building. This is fundamental, and this has to marry investment and infrastructure. So only when we have this sort of capacity building, um, career progression, and all of the rest of it, I think, can waste management be sustainable in a developing country forum. And part of this whole equation that has to be addressed by development is, is good governance. So if there's an absence of good governance, if there's an absence of transparency in how bids are managed, how contracts are awarded, if there's an absence of transparency in terms of how the district or the municipality are handling their finances, then this is a fundamental roadblock to achieving the desired end goal of sustainability, protection of environment and protection of public health. You've moved on very gracefully to the, uh, the difficult question. You know, you're well known, Mike, uh, amongst your friends as a corruption buster. Mm -hmm. You're not shy to, uh, to, to basically uh, speak out when, when it needs to happen. That's put yourself in, a, in, a, in difficult positions, uh, personally. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, people coming into the industry, working on the front line. What's the rule book? What do you need to know that you're getting into, how to protect yourself, on how to indeed navigate yourself around very difficult frontline issues such as corruption? Good question, good question. Um, Almost undoubtedly, if you spend any time in the developing world, on the ground, you're going to be faced by issues of, of poor governance, corruption being a major contribution to that. And I found myself 
Because my, my, my approach, my work profile has been, I don't like to parachute in for two weeks, write a report and leave. So the, the formative part of my career, I spent um, many years living in developing countries, as I say, as a catalyst in the middle of it, such as Ghana and Nigeria and Brunei in Asia, then moving on happily to the Caribbean where I spent many years. If you're in the middle of it, if you are trying to link all these diverse pieces of the jigsaw together, then you're going to encounter these sorts of problems. When I was younger and perhaps a little bit, was I bolder or more naive? I would make a point of shining the torch on corruption and malpractice in the government sector, which I still feel passionately that we have a role and a responsibility for doing. I still do it wherever I encounter it, but perhaps I'm a bit older, I'm a bit wiser, and there are ways of doing it in a less confrontational way, which doesn't lead you personally to risk your safety, risk your well-being, as mine has been compromised and risked on many occasions. I'm shortly going to embark on some very difficult work in an African country. I will be monitoring millions of dollars of work and it's been brought to my attention that the contracting process and the contractor who has the contract, the process is compromised, and that the agency for whom I'm monitoring the work are actually pulling the strings behind the company that got the contract. We've all been there, we all know about it, I'm going into it with my eyes open. I won't tolerate it, but what I won't do is I won't make it an open confrontation. I will do the best I can do to dismantle the problems I encounter in a, in a fashion that could hopefully unravel things, but in so doing, not put me directly in the firing line. Difficult question, and it's a question that many practitioners are going to have to face. That's a, I think that's a pretty, pretty good answer to that one, Mike. Thank you very much. You almost almost run out of questions after that. I'm, I was listening. To <laughs> But uh, I don't know whether Ranjif, whether you have uh, any 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 uh, questions coming in from other people. Please feel free to to fire them over to the chat. I'll have a look. But uh, in, in in the meantime, Mike, I mean, you are um, uh, you spoke about public awareness raising. I see this. I see this uh, uh, as being a major under underspend. And not uh, you know, forget about the development. Assistance industry, but but structurally within within countries uh, uh, in the waste management system, we you know we're sort of running headlong into a, into a speeding train that's coming in the opposite direction in, in a lot of the waste management uh, product projects. But you know, so in terms of also the 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 need to galvanise support from public to bring the uh, you know societies along with you for the journey. How do you? How do you go about doing that in the field? How much of your time would you normally spend on sort of like visibility aspects and promotion or and social and sort of the outreach to, uh, um, to, to the public? Sure, sure. Again, it's, it's location specific. What pertains on the ground? What are the avenues of communication, education? As you say, usually they're very, very poor, given scant attention, if given any attention at all. So if I'm to spend time on the ground in any given location, I would probably spend, in reality, between 25 and 50% of my time done allocated to community awareness, community engagement. And it's, it's multifaceted. That can be, if we're talking um, upgrading of waste management facilities, building a landfill site, wanting to increase the waste fee, the waste tariff, how waste is delivered. The starting point, and to me, the epicenter has to be the community. We have to engage with the community. We have to understand their expectations. We have to articulate clearly what it is we're aiming to do, what their roles and responsibilities are. And fundamentally, which doesn't often happen, fundamentally, we need to gain the approval and the endorsement of the community, so their stakeholders. Um, how you do that? Again, it's multifaceted. If I think back, for example, to work I did many years ago in Guyana, Georgetown, Guyana, a waste management uh, project where landfills were being built, 
waste collection was being restructured, new waste tariffs were coming in, hadn't given due thought to the whole societal aspect, awareness raising, consultation, and, and two-way dialogue. So um, being on the ground, I managed to recruit the services of a local company who had experience in this, and we put together um, a range of communication tools, ranging from a simple community meeting, going into the community at pre-arranged times, using town criers. So you're using the structures that exist. So you often have town criers who would announce um, public notices to, to the general residents with a bell. He would ring a bell. He would announce the meeting. The meeting would be ordained. That's a starting point, community meetings. And it got more sophisticated with things like TV and radio ads, but again, it's got to be appropriate. Are you working in an environment where the community has access to TV? In many African communities, I find the radio is a more powerful means of communication. The family would sit around the uh, radio at supper time. If you're putting out information, adverts, talk shows, get people involved in talk shows, let them ring in and challenge the decision makers. And again, in Georgetown, Guyana, we did something quite sophisticated but affordable and sustainable. We even made a TV soap opera based around community life, around a dump site, looking at the day-to-day -day lives of people. And some of the resident themes were people getting sick, children missing school, people being off work, and all of these things which had tangible links to bad waste management. But we put across in a way that was both entertaining but educational at the same part at the same time. Again, I'm in danger of meandering but it's a central topic and there's no one right approach. The approach has to be tailored to the local environment in which you're working. And if I had one wish, it would be that the development sector would pay far more attention to this whole aspect of engaging with the community. So when you uh, go in, I mean, you're, you've, you spend a lot of your career working in, uh, in post-disaster emergency response uh, issues, in, in post-conflict uh, uh, emergency response issues. And when you get on the ground, is this what you do? What do you do? What do you do on day one when you chip up after there's been an earthquake or, a, or there's been a, you know, an incident of some kind? Mm -hmm. Well, very often, um, in terms of emergencies, I've responded with the United Nations to natural emergencies in uh, Myanmar, China, Japan. Um, I'd say in the case of Japan and, and probably China, now as things evolve, quite sophisticated emergency response structures, procedures and professionals. Earlier on in the day, um, many years back, one would turn up and I think it would be fair to say, despite the best of intentions, one would usually be found with a situation of, of chaos, a lack of order, a lack of coordination. In the case of China, some years ago, the Sichuan earth, earthquakes, even the international community would be in disarray. You would be typically swamped with um, donor agencies um, of various disciplines, a lack of coordination, and everyone chipping away, trying to find their niche in the market. What is it they're, they're there to do? And often a lot of duplication and replication, even with the international community. So I think the starting point is really getting to understand as quickly as possible what the terrain is, who the key players are internationally and locally. And again, to try and act in a, in a coordination fashion around people having a shared goal, objective, and agreeing methodologies and who is going to do what. So again, that's about communication. It's about dialogue. And it's about goal setting. Um, as I say, I head off to um, a very difficult environment in Nigeria later this week in um, war-torn communities which have been in conflict and at war with the government of Nigeria. It relates to the oil industry, but again, very strong linkages with environment and waste management. Hundreds of thousands of tons of waste oil, uh, oil products, a very degraded environment fisheries impacted, water impacted, health impacted. My starting point is going to be communication with the communities. Again, why are we there? What are we trying to do? Can we enlist their support? And most importantly, what's missing in most of these environments, particularly in conflict environments, trust. We've got to engage and we've got to win the trust of the host communities. 
And that's hard won. It took me perhaps 18 months last time I was working in the Niger Delta. But that's my blueprint and that's my starting point. Work with the communities, be open, be transparent, and try and win trust. And then once you've won trust, you've got to keep that trust. So you've got to keep doing what you were doing, which is you have to keep dialoguing, you have to keep sharing experience, sharing data. And that would very much be my starting point, and that's where I'll be starting again later this week in, in the Niger Delta. Please, everybody uh, who's, uh, who's, who's online, feel free to write some questions uh, uh, in the uh, Q&A box below, and, uh, and, and, and we'll fire through uh, those to, to Mike. Uh, this is uh, golden, golden stuff, Mike, and uh, um, I'm sure everybody is... Uh, uh, wishing you well for the for that next uh, assignment because that's the next uh, challenge absolutely that's, yeah that's quite, absolutely that's obviously quite a full on one uh, uh, you know in terms of you know uh, uh, trying to you know round back to the issue of of the upward mobility of, of, of the young people in the industry i mean from the communities do you, are there are there, are there structural ways are oh, i've got a question in um, as well let me bounce, sorry Mike, let me bounce to a question because it's going to be far better than my one. Um, uh, this is, uh, they've got a couple now, is they're firing in, prepare yourself. Oh, there's what a third one coming in, if, if I could jump in here, and it's one from um, our colleague yep. Brian saying, have I seen his waste management playing cards? Sorry Brian, I, I can't help you with that one. I, I don't know where you are. <laughs> uh, we, we, do they exist? So. What advice would you give to someone starting afresh in waste management? How do we decide between the tracks of consulting or contracting, you know, uh, in, in doing implementation ourselves? That's uh, from Recycle Paper. So, okay, okay. Good question. Um, I don't think necessarily it's a question of one or the other. I think if there are opportunities there, I see contracting, I see consulting, I see regulation all as being complementary. So someone like Brian and Andy, the reason that they're of value in the field itself is because of a broad experience. And someone like myself, I, I go into the field, I've done many years as a regulator, I've done many years as an operator, I've built landfill sites, I've operated them, I've run waste collection um, companies and worked for the public sector in the city of London, I've educated, I've been a consultant. So I think it's very good to have rounded experience. And if waste management is the sector you wish to pursue, I see the different facets as interlinked and complementary. So if you have an opportunity to get in on the regulatory side, absolutely go for it. The contracting side, go for it. Um, because I think you'll find two or three years further down the line, as your experience grows, opportunities will open up to you. And you will then have the opportunity, as it were, to jump from one side of that dividing line, if indeed it is a dividing line, to the other. And I, at my age, I'm still hopping from one side to the other in terms of being a practitioner, being a regulator, a consultant, or a contractor. So go for whatever opportunities are there. And I think that there are very strong linkages between all of these uh, silos of opportunity, as it were. Okay, that question is uh, during Mike from Rohit. Uh, that, that question was from Narasimha, by the way. Uh, from Rohit, who's asking during the tendering process for a project, uh, there's a certain plan along with a cost benefit analysis uh, backing up the project. As you near the completion, do you feel uh, you stick to the payback period? Uh, do, does the does what is forecast? I guess this means is what is forecast in the cost benefit analysis in terms of underpinning the financial rationale of the project. Does it actually materialise? How much change is acceptable for a developing country when a lot of a lot of, fav, uh, a lot of funding is available? You know, so what's the uh, the difference between what's planned and forecast in order to justify the money expenditure? In, in contrast to actually what happens on the ground and, and what level of variability is manageable? Mm. That's a very interesting and challenging question. And the whole science, as it were, of cost-benefit analysis of environmental economics is, is it's an emerging topic. Um, 
One incidentally that my daughter's studying at university right now, Andy, and she'll be coming to you with her CV very shortly in terms of how we increase mobility in the sector. But um, I think there's a danger of being too uh, dogmatic in what we set out early. I think all models, all risks, have to build in a degree of flexibility. I, I know very few of any projects over my 30 odd years that have followed, followed the development blueprint, as it were, that was set out on the desk at the time of planning and funding a project. So I believe that we do have to, I, I come back to pragmatism, I come back to flexibility. I think as situations on the ground evolve, as circumstances arise, which perhaps were not anticipated, then we've got to be flexible and we've got to adjust. So I think sticking rigidly to the original plan, there's a danger that you're going to miss the subtle dynamic of, of the circumstances on the ground, both from a, a societal and political point of view. So I think as long as things are well benchmarked, as long as things are well accounted for, change of that nature is entirely foreseeable and entirely acceptable as well. Okay, so I mean, I'll add to that just to, just to, because I, um, uh, colleague uh, Peter Faircloth, uh, um, distinguished economist in our in our field, his rule of thumb was basically you if you double the cost and you half the revenues, does the project still work? Uh, now it's quite a brutal analysis to do, and very few projects would meet that mark, and uh, and, and uh, it's not necessarily the the uniform test, but. Uh, as a practitioner, if you want to feel on the, on the safe side, because I mean there are currency fluctuations can make a huge difference to uh, uh, to to to, pro to project uh, uh, performance. Definitely, when you have loan payback periods as well, um, cost recovery takes a lot of time in terms of uh, recovery of costs from from the public. It it rolls with the political cycle also. So those are, those are difficult things. Now we've got ten minutes to go. Um, so we're 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 going you know um, very nicely on there in terms of the uh, the, the pragmatism of uh, in your project design and in the work you do, Mike. Um, yeah. I mean, do you do you purposely uh, jack down the costs as 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 much as much as possible in order to not burden systems, or do you how do you gauge these things? I think. <laughs> I think the starting point, which again is often overlooked, is what is the affordability within the host community? Mm. Again, banks and everybody else very often um, will go into it, will come up with a project, will come up with a cost and repayments and the repayment loan period. And, and missing from that equation very often is what is affordable and what is sustainable? Now, I'm sure you've seen it, Andy, and Brian would have seen it just how much money is wasted on international waste management projects. And in an earlier phase of my career, I was employed for a period of time by the World Bank. And my task, or one of my tasks, was to review the amount of money spent in waste management infrastructure development projects and where they failed, which sadly they often fail, is try to determine what is the key factor that has made them fail. And more times than not, the most common cause of failure of these projects was an inadequate level of attention paid on affordability and cost recovery. So paybacks of loans are often hampered, sometimes become impossible quite simply because the issue of cost recovery, the, char the, the charging of, for example, of waste management fees the level of affordability, how those fees are going to be collected, a lack of attention on that is, from my experience, the leading cause of, of failure of waste management projects, whether it be new waste collection, new vehicles, new landfill site. So that kind of goes back and, and links a little bit to the question of um, payback periods and flexibility. And again, if nothing else, if, if we could get the, the international agencies to start paying more attention to the host community, bottom-up type approaches, what do they want, what's affordable and what's sustainable, then we would find a lot less of these projects actually failing in the long run. 
and indeed, I'm sure you'd lend to that as well. It's you know, the international agencies come and go. They are don't they? They're, don't they're they? Foreign, and they're also uh, competing with each other in the same terrain uh, uh, in, to a certain extent. You know, it's uh, it, it is a also an industry sector. At the end of the day, then it's the national governments, the ministries of finance that set set the budgetary procedures and set the financial conditions under which municipalities may operate sure, in any case sure. and the levels of subsidies and, uh, and, 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 and capital grants which uh, they can put, I, you know, I, I know from uh, uh, work uh, that, you know, the, the, the people, politicians do not like increasing taxes, it doesn't matter where they are uh, in, yeah. in government, yeah. which level of government, whether it's uh, federal, national, uh, provincial or, 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 or especially local. So alternative funding mechanisms are, 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 you know, rather than going direct charging to the household through, you know, property taxes or, or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, there are, you know, environmental charges uh, or levies, for example, you know, you, I know for that you uh, tried to lobby for an environmental levy, levy in, uh, in Caribbean countries on the from the tourism port shipping industry in order which, to which try and bridge this. In the long run, very successful, very successful. But again, it's not just about increasing the cost of fees to the householder because there's a lot of things missing, and I find it time and time again, one of the things missing is, for good reason, the communities, the residents, don't trust the politicians, whether you're talking about at the municipal level or at the state level or the national level. So if you're going to increase fees, you have to increase accountability, transparency, good governance, as we did in Guyana. I think there's an argument for ring fencing waste management fees. Don't collect fees which go into the consolidated fund and can't be accounted for. Ring fence waste management fees, put them into that account and publish your accounts regularly so people can see what's been paid in and how the fees have been paid. So there's a whole world of things that have to be done in terms of cost recovery and financial sustainability. Mike, we've got a good question in here from Luca. Uh, he's 31, or she, she, I don't know, Luca, that could run both ways there. Uh, 31 years old and I left a company I was working with for five years because I wanted to embrace in the challenge of working in the waste management sector. So he's left his job, wants to join, come into the industry, try to, wants to make a change in the world and finally, you know, orient his capabilities towards the sector but it doesn't have the experience, how would you suggest he goes about this? How do, you, know, how do you get into the way? Where, where does he start from? What would be the first action to take? Would you take a specialized course, try and get an intern program in UN or other multilateral agencies, or, or better focus on industries and their related waste management act activities, which I, I presume means, you know, getting inside as a, as a, as a, in your local area as an operator. In sure, sure. Yeah, I, I can respond to that from the international perspective, working in, in the, um, the development sector. Uh, so Lucas has worked for a period of time, was it five years or something like that? So yeah. already Lucas has five years of experience. Um, and within the waste management sector, many of the skills that you need are transferable from other sectors, whether it's industry, commerce, government. So. You know, it's about, are you a communicator? As Andy said, identifying your strength. Are you a communicator? Are you a, a technology person? Are you a hands-on community type? But there are many, many openings. Now, if you're sitting in Europe, for example, and you're wanting to get involved in the development sector in Asia, in Africa, very difficult because it comes back to this thing about what's your experience in developing countries. And the way that I have encouraged younger people to to bridge that gap in the past is take a long-term view on it i've encouraged and have facilitated younger people being involved in project management at the central area and in the field but sometimes you know you, you have to take a hit financially to win that experience so indeed when i was young i offered myself to be involved in things at no cost at no salary just cover you know, just cover my living expenses, for example, for three or six months so that I could gain experience, have something on my CV which was of worth and of value. And I've encouraged a number of young people to do likewise. If your skill set, if your experience isn't immediately tangible to the employer or the development agency, 
offer your services on a no cost basis for three or six months. And people would be receptive to that, such as the United Nations Environment Program. I facilitated a number of people who came in uh, as uh, project assistants on a voluntary basis. After six months, their chances of getting a job either within the UN or the development sector are enhanced massively by that hands-on experience. So you haven't, they haven't, you might not earn money for that period of time, but there's going to be a very long payback period thereafter when you've acquired that experience that is so essential in the field. I think that's uh, that's uh, good advice there, Mike. We got we're running out of time. We've got a got a, a few seconds to go. We've got less than a minute, and uh, I, you know I I I I'd echo that uh, uh, and say that you know the 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 issues and challenges which we are facing and which are being faced uh, uh, are not going away quickly. In fact, they're intensifying. This is a, a, a long-term industry. It's with a, with a whole a whole future to it. Uh, it's worth getting stuck in. It certainly hasn't done us too badly, Mike. We've kept ourselves interested and involved. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best on that one. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, hmm? I, I say, from my side, I would certainly encourage people, be they young or old, with a passion, with an environmental passion, a passion for public health and development. To, to get involved because one thing I have never been in over my 30 years, I've never yet been bored. And I'm sure Andy, you would attest to the same. It's it's never boring, it's challenging, it's dynamic, it's exciting, and you never know what's gonna come around the corner and hit you next. Indeed, so on that one, thanks very much, Mike. Um, we was pretty soft on you there actually, mate. It was so, very soft. Uh, I hope I Thank get, you. you know. So, passing back to Ranjith. It's appreciated, thanks, Lance.